Thinking about my life growing up in Camden, New Jersey, in a single parent home with a father who was a victim of the criminal justice system and spent the majority of my life in prison. It's very, very traumatizing for young people growing up in this environment because if you're constantly seeing people who look like you in prison, losing their lives to street violence, you're gonna internalize these, these external forces in your community and in your environment and you're gonna believe that that's your fate or that's your destiny. You know, as rough as this city is, this city made me the person I am today. Uh, I experienced a lot of love here, a lot of support, in spite of all, all of the negativity that goes on each and every day. So I, I grew up on the east side of Camden, attended public schools there my entire life, from kindergarten all the way through uh, 12th grade graduation. Now this area is uh, particularly uh, uh, important in my whole life uh, story. This street here is Bank Street. Um, I actually was arrested January 29th, 2009, right here um, on Pfeiffer uh, Street, right off of Bank Street. Uh, and this is where my life changed. My thing wasn't to get rich. It was just to get my, me and my family by. What I did was I knew some people who was doing some things. And I just got down with it. In the process of me getting down with it, I started making some money. I started helping the family like I supposed to. But I knew the consequences that one day I might get locked up. I didn't care. Spent a lot of time on this block here on Rand and Bank Street. Um, actually lost a few friends to this block. Uh, a few lives were lost to, you know, to violence, to gun violence specifically. We all lived around here. You know, some is dead now. A few of them is dead. K. Lou, Mikey, Big Will, Mukadeen, Salahuddin, Rat, Vern Lope. You know what I mean? Them guys is gone, man. And, you know, I miss them like crazy. I miss them like crazy. As we think about the over-policing in inner cities across America, as we think about the school to prison pipeline and these different things that we're working diligently to uproot, um, I think it's something that people need to understand that a kid who could have been a statistic had the ability you know, to really challenge himself intellectually and go on to uh, one of the top schools in the country and also be able to work at the White House. The crazy thing is I graduated in June of 92, when a lot of other kids was going to um, college or trade schools or whatever. I went in in August, went to jail. And that's when it all started, in and out, in and out, in and out. It was like, you know what I mean, it was hell. This is not a story about Camden. I grew up in Camden and went to school in the city. I know Camden has its challenges, but as a federal law enforcement officer, I also know America. And this is a story about America and how it treats its kids, particularly its male students of color. Across the country, as many as 95% of out-of-school suspensions have been for nonviolent misbehavior. Things like being disruptive, acting disrespectfully, being late, cursing, and being out of dress code. Now these suspensions are not exactly happening equally across the board. Black and Latino students make up about 38% of the American student body, but they make up 70% of students involved in in-school arrests or law enforcement referrals. If schools call the police for a minor infraction, if they suspend students, or if they don't engage students, they, and by they, I mean we, are much more likely to lose those students. Students who feel disengaged from school are more likely to drop out of school. And students who drop out of school are much more likely to go to prison. I waste a lot of time right here. Just every day, every day was like a Friday. Running in and out of the alleys. People coming up, pulling up, asking for drugs. 
I will actually sit out here. Like 16, almost 20 hours a day. Just out here. You know what I'm saying? Just out here. Me and my friends. I would describe my experience in Wilson as a young man. We'd often be in the hallways, skipping class, just, you know, hanging out, right? And when I look back, about 98% of the young men who were skipping class and hanging in the hallways, that turned into them hanging on street corners, engaging in criminal activity, including myself, you know, getting caught up and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. When he got to high school, it was more or less, I kind of lost control of him a little bit. Um, Whereas, you know, he was doing what he wanted to do. Um, he left my house every morning as if he was going to school. People were punished for some of their behaviors, uh, such as playing cards, which I think probably was too extreme of a punishment to send somebody out of school because all you were doing were pushing that student closer to the, the street crime that they already probably were tinkering on and off with or that they were curious in. Uh, so I don't think that was the most productive strategy. And it became a point where so many young guys would get in trouble for playing cards or skipping class and doing things that if you have a whole laundry list of, of young guys who are suspended, you may be friends with five of these guys who are suspended for a week. And if you hang with those guys every day but you're not suspended, that results in you skipping class. So it's almost like one of the old adage, you know, birds of a feather flock together. So you'll become your, your environment. You know, if six of your friends, five of your friends aren't going to school Monday through Friday, then hey, you probably won't go to school. America is not kind to you once you've made a mistake. Um, it's very hard to come up once you've been incarcerated. Um, and I just really wanted my sons to understand this. January 29, 2009, I was walking down the street here. Uh, had all black on, it was a cold winter night. It was my senior year. I was 17, 18. Right here used to be a house. We were sitting right here on his step. One of my friends got into whatever he got into down there on 4th and West Street. We came back here. And it was like crazy because it was like a little red car coming around that corner right here. And as I was crossing the street right here, this intersection between Bank and Pfeiffer Street to go visit a friend, the police car came up this way, uh, task force. And for no apparent reason, they told me to stop. Uh, and they hopped out and pursued me with weapons drawn. When the car stopped right here, three guys jumped out with guns. So the guys who was from this area with me it was like all around, across the street, and everybody had guns too. But we just didn't know what to expect. I ran out of fear. Uh, and it was something that I think anybody would have done in my circumstance. Um, I was arrested right here, about 50 feet from where we're standing right now. And I got to here, and I felt the burn. When I got like right here, I felt the burn. That's when the bullet went in, came out. And you still see shots, even on this wall. This house, here, shots on this wall. It was crazy. That's how long I've been in the system. From 92 to 2011. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's hard. It's easy to get in trouble, but it's hard to get out, man. So I've, I've, I haven't been in, since I've been home, you know what I mean? I haven't been in no trouble or anything, you know what I mean? I've never been even uh, searched by the police or nothing, so. He wasn't, I mean, he wasn't really bad, what you would call a, a bad boy when he was coming up. He was, um, I'll put it like, say, a little mischievous. You know, say a little mischievous. He wanted to get out there and see what the world see was the like. World. And he started experiencing being in the streets and selling drugs and stuff. So that's when he got caught up with the law. Mm -hmm. And he went away and he did a lot of time. And then he learned from that. The day that he didn't got incarcerated, I didn't go that day. Mm -mm, I, stayed, I, I couldn't go that day. I didn't go that day. This picture here, 
This is the one that I think of this one all the time. It's when I was down raw and I was in East Georgia State Prison. This would keep me motivated. This, this is my drive to never go back to like see my family. You know, to come down to prison and see me. Nah. That's so degrading. It's so easy to get in trouble. But it's hard to get out. Very hard. My thing with um dad is how do you persevere once you get in trouble? That will tell how you gonna get come out. I'll send one of my guys to come give me a quote and we can see if we can replace your porch because I was one of the ones who helped tear it down. Come on in. Urban Bank Hall, you know? This is my domain, man. This is my bread and butter. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I tell everybody I'm here 25 and 8, man. You know what I mean? I'm, this is what I do. I sat down with him and I told him, I said, you know, that's your first strike with me and your only strike that I'm going to give you as far as prison. Um, I spent a lot of time going back and forth to prison with Rashawn State penitentiaries with Rashawn's father and I worked too hard to do this with my sons. And you see this repetitive cycle, you know, of generation after generation being consumed by this, this criminal culture and this prison industrial system and I began to think about those things in that short period of time that I was in a county jail and I knew that it just wasn't right. It just didn't feel right inside. When I was released, I didn't really know what to think. Uh, you know, at that time, going to Camden County Jail was the norm. Almost every young guy that I knew or that I was friends with was already there or already in prison. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that surprised me, and that was the discouraging part, is that it was almost like this was expected. So when I was released from County Jail, I spent a lot of time at home trying to game plan, trying to figure this whole thing of life out. And the one thing that kept coming back to me was school, 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 education. Uh, that can be something that can help turn my life around. I'm the only one from out here, well, we was out here, I'm the only one who graduated high school. Because a lot of my friends, they dropped out eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. I just wasn't able to further my education because, uh, like I said, I, I went to prison, you know what I mean? Uh, I was very rough around the edges. Uh, I had a lot of things to work on, my speech, uh, my confidence, uh, and most importantly, my work ethic. I didn't have a strong work ethic when it came to academic studies at all. Um, I've never read books. I didn't know how to properly take notes. I wasn't engaged. But when I had this opportunity to go back to school and after my uh, incarceration -ish, uh, experience, I began to tap into my intellectual side because I began to try to figure myself out. Why am I labeled a statistic? Who, who labeled me as such? And why do I have to become a victim of my environment, right? So I started reading books. Uh, Souls of Black Folk, W.E.B. Du Bois was the first book I've ever read. Uh, from there, I read Martin Luther King's book on leadership. That was the first book I outlined, uh, 23 pages front and back. And I began to really enjoy it. I began to enjoy learning things about the world that I didn't know existed. And when I hit Camden County in, fall, in the fall of 2010, I hit the ground running. My career trajectory changed when I had the uh, magnificent opportunity to go to the University of Pennsylvania. And I studied political science and economic policy, uh, which led me ultimately to going to the White House and working there and getting involved in the government. You know, then he got the opportunity to work with Obama. That was just, oh man, we were, whew. The first black president to be a part of that um, administration. <laughs> I think that was like maybe the second proudest um, moment for me as a mom to, to, to know that my son was um, a part of that history.
education was everything. All of the small steps, even me starting a community college, prepared me for the opportunity at the White House. Um, learning how to think critically, um, learning how to analyze information, also learning how to synthesize, something that I wasn't really familiar with. But being able to take information from all areas, bring it together, compile it, and then let the information tell a, a story, a story that makes sense, not only for me, but for the people who are gonna be reading that message. Um, so school meant everything, and uh, I truly believe, in the words of Nelson Mandela, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Uh, I know that you know we have entertainers, we have athletes and everything uh, who make a, a great living. Uh, but education is the focal point, and it should be the focal point that's gonna help uplift communities. A system might be unjust, and the balance of power might be tilted, but we are not powerless. There are things we can do, steps we can take, and steps we can pressure others to take to change these outcomes. Consider suspension rates. The school district used to suspend kids reflexively. You dress out of the school uniform on your birthday because your brother soiled your uniform that morning. Suspension. You splash juice in the cafeteria. Call the cops. The school district suspended more than 1,000 students in the 2015-2016 school year. And that's not right. They could do better. And in 2016-2017, they did. As awareness grew about the effect of these actions and practices changed, the number of students suspended fell by more than half. More and more, schools are exercising trauma-informed care and putting restorative practices into place. In short, they're making it harder to get into trouble and easier to get out of it. There's plenty more work to do, but progress should be noted. A suspension rate falling by more than 50% is not a little fact to trot out. Those are hundreds of students whose path is a little bit different than it otherwise might have been, who are a little bit less likely to end up in the criminal justice system and a little bit more likely to end up in college or the White House. If I knew what I know now back then, I'll own so much more and I'll have so much more. You know what I'm saying? I would have I would have more than I have now. Having an education really freed him from bondage of the ghetto. And it's no other way to um, explain it but like that. It just freed him. He's really from the shackles of where he was headed. It, education really freed it saved my son. You're never powerless. You become powerless when you believe that you are powerless. Everyone has a choice. And that's something that you can never, ever, ever let go of, is your ability to have a choice. Whether it's systemic racism, uh, through mass incarceration, through the education system, lack of opportunity, the power is in your hands to transform your life. But you have to be committed. You have the choice, you have a choice, and, and don't ever let anyone or any institution or system take your choice away from you.